Let's lead out. One out. Good jump. Hey, me and you right here. Let's go. Two down. Two down. I'm Darren, and I'm one of the pastors here at Focus, and I am so excited to be able to say Happy New Year to everybody. I've, man, we love church in your PJs. It's a powerful time for us to be able to celebrate Jesus when we gather online and we celebrate with our friends and our family in the comfort of our own PJs. But I got to tell you something. I, I don't like it personally, myself, because I miss y'all. I miss y'all. I'm telling you what, like, I could not wait for this Sunday to get here because I just missed seeing everybody. I love my church family, and I'm so excited to be able to say, welcome home. Come on. And for all of our guests that are here, too, we want you to know this, that we're a church family that has open arms. We're a church family that loves to be able to grow. We don't want to just be a small, tight-knit group of people. Man, we're a large family. And so all of our guests that are here today, Focus, can you just please, in one loud voice, say welcome home to all of our guests as well? Welcome home! Man, I tell you what, I'm excited for what God has for us. This is going to be a powerful year for our church. I believe it with everything inside of me. Come on, it's 2020. Right? Like vision, a 2020 vision, right? Yeah. To be in focus. Come on, somebody. It was like God planted our church here just for this year, right? That's what I'm saying to myself, at least. I don't know. Like, I believe it with everything inside of me that, that God has something amazing in store for our church. God has something amazing in store for each and every single one of you. When we focus on Jesus. When we focus on what God has for us, that's what I believe with everything inside of me, that God has something in store for each and every single one of you. Focus is so important, isn't it? Focus is powerful. Focus is something that, focus is something that helps you succeed in life, doesn't it? Right? Like, I don't know about you, but focus is something that is so important inside of my, focus can be hard though at times, can it? Like, I, does anybody in here uh, work from home? I got anybody that work from home in here? I work from, uh, we, we're, yeah, so we've got some people working from home. Working from home is amazing, right? Like, the commute is fantastic. Yeah. Love the commute from working from home. But it's also difficult at times because you're at home. And there's a lot of distractions that are going on at home. That's just all there is to it. There's a lot of distractions because, because in my house for the last two weeks, uh, I have two small boys. I got an 11-year-old and a 7-year-old. They would not want me to use the word small towards them at all. Like, we're big, okay? Like, I just realized that I said small about that. But they, they're at the house for the last two weeks. They got break, right? And so I'm sitting in the office, and I'm trying to type out something, you know, some thoughts. I'm trying to work on a message. It's like Sunday was coming, right? Like there's got to be a message. And every, it seemed like every six seconds, what was going on? Knocking at the door. Hey, Dad, you want to be able to come to see what I did on Fortnite? I would love to, but come on, right? Like somebody's, somebody's got to be able to get some work done around here. Distractions come around all the time, don't they? Focus is so important for us, but, but it's so hard as well. One of the questions that, that my son, my oldest son, my 11-year-old Jude, what he asked me was, um, he said, hey, Dad, have, have you ever been in a car accident? And, uh, and, and I thought to myself, why, why is he asking this question? And then I thought, maybe it's, because, maybe it's because he's like trying to determine if it's safe enough to drive with me anymore, right? <laughs> this is the beginning of all of the questioning of his dad. I am no longer Superman in his life. He's questioning everything. This, this is the beginning of the end, isn't it? Teenage years are right around the corner. 
I got a teenager is what I got right now, right? So he's asking this question. He says, hey, Dad, have you ever been in an accident? And I said, I said yeah, yeah, I've been in, in a car accident before. And then the question was, uh, uh, was it your fault? <laughs> like, well, which one? Right? Like, and so I'm thinking about that question of, of which one uh, or, or if it was my fault. And I said, well, some of them have, have been, yeah. And it, and it brought me back to uh, my, first, my very first car accident. So I'm, I'm 16 years old, maybe 17 years old at that time, and, and, uh, and I'm, sitting at, I'm sitting at a stoplight, and I'm getting ready to uh, turn left. I'm in the left turn lane, and, and uh, there's a couple of cars in front of me, and, and I'm sitting there, and off to the left uh, is, is a bank. It has a little driveway that comes out of it, and, and as I'm sitting at the light, and I'm looking at this red light, I'm waiting for my turn to be able to go, uh, out, of the, out, of, out of the left side, I see a car that's getting ready to come out of the bank, and it's one of my buddies, and this is back in the day when you used to use banks, you know, that's what I'm talking about, right? Like, uh, so, so I see a buddy uh, coming out of, of the bank, and, and my thought is, I want to say hello, right? So I, I, I rolled the window down. Uh, yes, it was one of these because I bought my first car. Come on, somebody, right? So I rolled I roll the window down, and, and, uh, and I give him some sort of, of hello, like, you know, so, like one of those, or, or maybe, well, I don't know, or, hey, how you doing? I don't know whatever it was, you know? Like, I just wanted to be able to say hello to him. And then out of my peripheral vision, I'm turned left looking at him, and out of the peripheral vision that I have, I see the light change from red to green. From red to green. Now, here's something about my worldview, just so you know. In, in my worldview, it's my belief that people are on the move and want to get places. It's my belief that, that when you're at a red light, that green means go. That's my worldview. My worldview is also that people don't want to wait for me. Right? Like I'm, I'm very conscientious of, of, of space and, and I want to make sure that people aren't like, I'm not bothering somebody else, you know? So people don't want to wait for me to be able to miss their light possibly. It's also my worldview that other people have the same belief system that I do. So it's my belief that green means go and that people don't want to wait for me. So my foot responds to my worldview and out of my peripheral, I see green and my foot says go. The person in front of me did not have that same belief system. <laughs> Their worldview was we'll get there when we get there. And so, boom, I just slammed right into the back of that person's car. And wouldn't you know it, uh, as, as my buddy is turning uh, out of that bank, he sees me and he just sits there and laughs at me. <laughs> it's not very life-giving, Brent. Come on, somebody. But that's all right. Forgiveness is in my heart if you ever see this. Was that, was that, was that accident my fault? Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps it was... Somebody just didn't want to go. Come on, right? Or perhaps it was because, because I was distracted from the mission that I had. I wasn't focused where I needed to be. And I put my focus someplace else. See, the reality for us is this, is that when you get distracted, accidents happen in all aspects of life. Focus is important for your driver's safety, right? Focus is important. Focus is important for the success that you have in life. Focus is important for your own productivity. Because when you get distracted, accidents happen. I didn't mean to slam into the back of that lady. Accidents happen. I didn't mean to say that to this person. But I was distracted by something else and it just slipped out. I didn't, I didn't mean to be able to drop that and break that whole glass of milk, but I was distracted by something else. When you get distracted, accidents will happen in all areas of life. So the question that I have for you starting today and starting this series and starting out this year is this. Where is your focus? What is the focus that you have for your life? 
Let me ask you maybe this way, because you might not have thought about it as far as where your focus is. Let me ask you this way. What do you want out of life? See, most of us, most of us would, would answer, well, I want, I want to be able to have a good relationship. I want to be able to have good kids. I want to be able to have a, a, I want to have a nice job. I want to have a good job. I want to have a, a good house, a couple of houses. I want to be able to be comfortable. I want to be able to, I want to be able to have, I want a good life, right? That's what, that's what I want. I want, a, I want a good life. I want to be able to have good things. I want to be able to go on vacation every once in a while. I want to be able to have a, I want people to respect me. I want to be able to be productive. I want a good life. A good life, that's, that's good, right? But I'm here today to tell you this. The good life is something that we just settle for. Because that might be the goal that you have for your life, but I'm here today to tell you this, that God has so much more in store for you than just a good life. God has something that is bigger than just a good life for you. Where is your focus at? Is your focus just on a good life, or do you want to place your focus upon a God life? Because I'm here today to tell you this. What God has in store for each and every single one of us is so much bigger than just a good life. And when this is your goal, I'm telling you, you're just settling. You're just settling. So today what I hope to do is I hope to be able to re redirect your focus. Be able to redirect your goals. And see where God has us to focus on for this year for this series, for our lives. I'm telling you today, God has something amazing in store for you. What is it that he has in store for you? What is the goal that God has? What is the plan that he has for you? Come on, somebody, John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come. Jesus came here. He came to do what? To give you life and give it to you in the full. Come on, somebody. God's plan for your life is that you can have a full life. And we love that word, the full, right? Come on, somebody help me out here. What's the Greek word for the full life right there? Parasos. For those of you that are guests here, this is a big verse for us. Why is this such a big for, verse for us here at our church? Why do you hear me talk about it all the time? Because this is God's plan for your life. And one day you're going to grasp it. One day you're going to get a hold of it and you're going to say, I'm going to stop settling for the good life and I'm going to go after the life that God has for me, which is the parasol's life, which translated means this, exceedingly and abundantly. Amen. That's a little bit better than good. That's a little bit better than great. That's exceeding all of my expectations in this life. Abundance means it's more than I can handle myself. It's more than I can handle myself. I have abundant. I got a, I got, somebody came up to me yesterday. They got a bunch of chickens that they're raising. And they're like, hey, we got a bunch of eggs. I got an abundance of eggs. You want some eggs? Come on. God has abundance of eggs for your life. You're like, I don't, I don't want that. I don't like, I don't really care for the eggs, right? Abundance of joy that overwhelms you and overflows from you. I don't know about you, but but we are in a world that desperately needs some joy. Abundance of peace in a world full of chaos that it overwhelms you and overflows from you. A peace that surpasses all understanding. God's plan for your life is to experience exceedingly and abundantly more, more than you could ever imagine. Too often we just settle for good. Too often we just settle for, for the things here on earth. What I'm here today to tell you is this, is that God's plan for your life is to be able to be exceedingly abundantly more that you, you realize that the things of this earth don't matter anymore. It changes your perspective. It changes your focus. I don't need to settle for this stuff anymore. 
I don't need to settle for a good house. I don't need to settle for a good car. I don't need to settle for a good job. I'm not worried about any of that stuff anymore. Instead, my focus is upon Jesus. And Matthew 6.33 says this. It says, seek first his kingdom. And then all these things will be added. Come on. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And then the things of this earth, they will be added to you. I'm not worried about the good things of this world. I'm worried about seeking Jesus. And then I'm going to celebrate when the good things of this world come around. I'm not upset about that. Anybody like good stuff? If you didn't raise your hand on liking good stuff, you are lying. (laughs) Nobody likes bad stuff. Come on, right? Like, what'd you get for Christmas? A bunch of bad stuff. It was my favorite Christmas ever. No! Right? Like you open up that one bad gift and you're like, did you get a gift receipt with this? Because I don't know, I'm not going to ever use this thing. And nobody else is like that? Here's what my wife and I figured out a long time ago. That before Christmas, we go out shopping together. She buys all of her gifts and then I just wrap them up. <laughs> Come on, right? Yeah. I do the exact same thing, but then I'm like, I don't want to wait. I want to wear that thing this weekend, right? Anybody? Like, why do I have to wait? I just got it, right? We like good stuff, but that's not what the importance is. That's not where the focus is. Our focus is on Jesus, and then all of these things, they're going to be added. I'm not going to worry about them anymore. Why? Because my focus is on Jesus. So my question is, where is your focus? Where's your focus? Here's, what, here's the great thing about Here's the great thing about what God has for us and this goal that he has. For you to experience Parasaw's life. Again, I talk about this so much because I believe with everything inside of me that his plan is for you to experience that kind of life. Exceedingly and abundantly more. That's what his plan is for you. And the great thing is, is that he has created a plan for you to attain that goal. So if you're in a place where you're like, I, I, I'm not living an exceeding life. I'm not, it doesn't feel like abundance today, that's for sure. God has a plan to help you redirect your focus. So if your focus has been on all of the things of this earth and you're just asking God to bless the things of this earth, come on God, I, I need help in this area right here and so you come down and help me. God has a plan for you to redirect your focus. So that you can seek first his kingdom and then not worry about all the rest of this. God has a plan for your life. Is anybody ready to hear that plan? Is anybody ready to hear the steps that God has for you to put your focus completely on him? That's what we're going to do today and that's what we're going to do during this series. Is we're going to talk through the steps that God has for you to achieve the goal of living a parasauce life. The great thing about this plan is I'm telling you, you see it all throughout scripture. We just don't open our eyes to it. You can see it all throughout Scripture that God has a plan for you to be able to walk these steps to redirect your focus completely upon him. You see it happen in Exodus where where God is leading the the people of of Israel out of of Egypt and, and then he tells them, hey, this is how you celebrate the Passover and he gives these four steps inside of Passover. We see it in, in Ephesians where, where Paul is explaining what it means to follow in these steps. And we're going to see Jesus talk about these steps that he has for us found in one of the greatest stories, one of my favorite stories that he's ever told. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through this entire story and then we're going to go through it and we're going to break it down. God's step by step plan for you to redirect your focus and to be able to achieve the goal of living a parasauce life. Come on, somebody. This is going to be so practical and so powerful for you to have a new year and a new you. Anybody ready to hear this plan now? Let's go ahead and read this story. So this is Jesus speaking, and he says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed, and some, some of it fell along the path, and, and the birds came and ate it up. Continue on. Some fell on rocky places where, where it did not have much soil. It, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had 
no root. Hello, Arizona. Come on. Other seed fell along m- among thorns, which grew up and, and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the story and these are the steps that God has for us to live the goal, to live in the parasol's life. This is what he has for us. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to break this story down and I want to be able to see how we can live in that life. Let's go back to the very beginning in Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. So then he told them many things in parables. And so let me pause right there and, and explain the parable. What is, it, what is it, a parable? A parable is a story that Jesus would tell that had a spiritual truth tied behind it. That's, what, that's exactly what a parable is. It's just a story that he told that had meaning and a spiritual truth that was tied to it. And this parable, this parable has, has some major players in it. This story has some major players. The, the first player that we see is, is the farmer. Well, who's the, who's the farmer in this? What's the spiritual truth that we can see from this story? Who is the farmer? Well, the farmer is anybody who, who talks about the goodness of Jesus. It's anybody who talks about the good news of Jesus, the gospel. And that's exactly what the word gospel means. Is it means good news. So the farmer is anybody who talks about the good news of Jesus. It could be me standing up here as I am right now, or, or it could be you sitting in a coffee shop, sitting at your work, sitting uh, around a table, whatever it is. It's, it's anybody who is talking about the good news of Jesus, which is exactly what the seed is. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. What, what, is, what is the good news of Jesus? The good news of Jesus is that, is that he loves you. The good news of Jesus is that he loves you so much that he left heaven and came down to earth and was born just as you and I are. He grew up just as you and I have. Some of us, right? Like a man child over there, right? Like he grew up and he experienced life. He experienced joy. He experienced heartache. He experienced loss. He experienced the same things that you and I experienced. He's tempt, he was tempted in the exact same way that you and I are tempted, yet he was sinless. That's the difference. He was fully man and fully God, and, and he was completely sinless. And because he was completely sinless, it gave him the opportunity to take all of the sins of humanity upon himself and become the perfect sacrifice for us. That's the good news of Jesus. Is that when we say yes to Jesus then we can go to the Father, God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And the good news of Jesus is that, is that to be able to experience that, to be able to have a relationship with God, you just simply say yes. That's all it is. It's just as simple as that, is that you just simply say yes to Jesus. That's the good news of Jesus. It's powerful. It is wonderful. It's the good news of Jesus. But then there's another player that's in there. We got the farmer, we got the seed, and then go on to verse four. And as he's scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So what we see is that we see this farmer, we see him talking about the good news of Jesus, but then it falls upon four different types of soil, four different types of ground. There's the path, there's this rocky area, there's this area with thorns, come on, it's like Arizona all tied up in all of these, right? Except for the good soil at the very end. I don't know how, I don't know how, like it blew my mind when I, when I moved to Arizona seven years ago that they could grow corn. Anybody else blown away by that? It still shocks me, man. I grew up in Iowa where corn was like that tall, now the corn's this tall, but anyway, it still blows me away, like. Man, I'm getting all distracted in a, in a message about being focused. Come on. Like, 
get back on topic. Here we go, right? There's four different types of soils, and that's what we're going to do is we're going to break down what these soils are. We're going to see where the step is that God has to lead us, and we're also going to see how in each and every single one of those steps that there are distractions that pull us away from the focus that God has for us. So the first one that we're going to look at is this. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. The first step that God has for us to redirect our focus to achieve a parasauce, exceedingly abundant kind of life, the first step that he has for us is to do this, to know and follow God. To know and follow God. How do I go from just settling for a good life to striving after the God life that he has for me? How do I do that? How do I go after that? You have to make the choice to know and follow God. It's as simple as that. How do you know, how do you know God? Like that seems so that seems so big and so foreign to so many of us, right? Like know God. Like I can know somebody because I can see you, but man, knowing how do I know God? How do I follow God? I'm telling you, it is so simple. Just as I said. Jesus wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. It is there for you. So here's how you follow. Here's how you know when you follow God. You simply say yes. That's the good news. The good news that I have for you today is that the first step is it's so simple. You just say yes. You just say yes to a relationship with Jesus. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to be able to, he, he desperately wants to know you. He loved you so much that he came down here. You just say yes. That's all you have to do. But, what you, like you mean, you mean like say yes? Like yes! That's all you got to do. It's just simply say yes. But just because it's that simple doesn't mean it's that easy, Right? Because there's distractions that, that fall in along with that as well. Because it seems, it seems so foreign. Like the, you're talking about God like in this big way and that I just say yes and then I have a relationship with him. And, and the distractions of this world come in a big way. Jesus outlined the distractions as well. He gives a meaning of this parable and he, and he shows us the distractions that keep us from knowing and following God. Matthew 13, starting in verse 18, it said this. It says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, the good news of Jesus, right? Like when anyone hears it and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart in this seed sown along the path. See, to say yes to Jesus is what, ha what happens is that, is that somebody's sitting there talking to you about Jesus. Maybe today is the day for you. You hear me talking about it. You see us singing songs. You see people excited and you're like, man, there's something going on there. I just don't know. I don't know what it is. I might not understand it. And what, what happens is that when you start to hear about Jesus and the good news that he has for you, that, that all of those hurts and all of those pains from the past, that Jesus can bring healing to that. That Jesus can, he, Jesus can lead you on a path that you're going to experience a life that even when there is pain and even when there is hurt inside of your life, that there's still going to be joy there. There's still going to be connection there. You allow it to penetrate your heart and your soul. But when you don't understand it, you never allow for it to penetrate. And so the distraction that comes with knowing and following God, I don't understand it, so I don't accept it. That's a distraction that we have. That's a distraction that some of you might have. You're like, okay, I'm going to church all the time because this person wants me to, but I don't get it. And so I'll go to church because I want a good life and I want a good marriage, and I'm just trying to make sure everything is okay inside of my house. But I don't get it. So I'm not going to accept it. 
That's the distraction that we have. I know better, and I don't understand this. I'm going to tell you, Jesus understands that. He gets it. Scripture even says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Once you accept it, all of a sudden you're going to realize, like, I'm experiencing freedom like I never had before. I'm in the middle of loss, and yet I know that God is with me through this. It seems like there should be darkness all around me, but yet, yet I feel his love, and I feel light. I feel like there's, there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel, and before it would be... When you accept it, all of a sudden you begin to experience the power of the cross. But the distraction is, is that that doesn't make any sense. So it seems like foolishness, Right? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. And that's where some of us find ourselves. I don't get what Scripture says. I don't understand it. I've tried to. I've tried to understand it. But I, don't get, I don't get it. I'm frustrated. That's the distraction of it. Is that it doesn't, that, that doesn't make sense. Right? I don't understand it. That's the distraction. So here's what I hope to do for the rest of the time that we have. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to help you try to understand some of those things that we don't understand. I know that that's a big deal, right? Like That's a lot to tackle. And if you have more questions, I want to encourage, come and ask me, ask one of our pastors afterwards because we want to help you understand it so that you can receive and, and you can accept the power of the cross in a big way. But here are some of the things that we don't get and we're like, man, God is so big and I'm just this and, and just saying yes and receiving it, like that's just, that's too simple. It can't be that simple because here are the distractions that get us in the way where we don't understand why this is so simple. These are the distractions. The first distraction that we have is this. I'm supposed to do more. For me... For me to be able to have a relationship with God, I got to do more, right? Like, I got to do good things for, it, for me to be able to have a relationship with God, right? Like, it, it demands that, right? Like, I, I have to do more good things, right? Well, John 5, 39 says, you study the scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. You try to help other people so much because you think just in helping that you're going to receive eternal life. You try to pray so much more because you think just in praying that you're going to receive eternal life. But that's not the way that it goes. The reason why we read scripture, the reason why we pray, the reason why we help other people, the reason why that we worship is not so that we are going to prove ourselves to God. It's so that it will bring us closer to God. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me. You just have to come to Jesus. The distraction is I have to do more. But I'm here to tell you that the focus is this, is that all I have to do is I just receive what has already been done. I don't have to do anything. Jesus loves you no matter what. Jesus loves you. I just say yes. The distraction is, I got to do more. No, no, you don't. You just receive what God has already done. Well, that doesn't, no, come on. I have to do more because the other distraction that we have is, I have to earn God's approval. Right? Like, if I want to have a good relationship with somebody here, I have to earn it. People don't just give away good relationships. I got to earn it. The same has to be true for God, right? I mean, it was true that I had to earn my own dad's approval. He didn't just say he was proud of me just because I did nothing. I had to make sure that my room was cleaned. And then he said, hey, I'm proud of you for that. I had to do the dishes. And then he said, hey, I'm proud of you. I had to good grades. And then, and then he said he was proud of me. That's the way that it was with my mom. She wouldn't just say that. I had to be able to show it. 
And if that's what that relationship was like, then obviously the God, I have to earn his approval, right? That's the distraction that we have. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrated his own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for you. You don't have to do anything to earn God's approval. That's the distraction that we have. But the focus is that we simply receive God's love. You just receive it. You just say yes. And God loves you. God loves all of the perfect things about you, and he loves all of the imperfections. God loves all of the successes, and he loves all of the failures as well. He loves you so much that while you were still a sinner, as I was still a sinner, he still died for me. I don't have to do anything. I just receive. I just say yes. Man, the distractions get us. The distractions pull us away in different areas. I don't understand it, so I just... But you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to church, and I'm going to do this. I don't get all of those things, but, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to earn God's approval. I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to make sure. And so we do this. It leads us to this place where we, man, I obey God because I have to. I obey him out of obligation. I have to do it because if I don't, man, I'm going to be done. Like God's done with me. If I don't follow exactly what Scripture says, well, then I'm going to be out of his blessings. He's going to take away. He's going to take away salvation from me. I have to do it, right? That's what it feels like sometimes. I have to give. I've got, I've got to be able to give my money or he's going to take all the money away. I have to make sure that I'm, I'm sitting at, at church or if I'm not at church, then, then God's going to smite me because he's the miter smiting of smiting, right? Like, like that's, I have to do it. I'm telling you, that, that is such a burden to bear. Because I, I don't know about you, but I fail at following all of God's commands all the time. And I can't obey him all the time. And so then it just feels like, if I can't, then why even try? But God's plan for you is not to just obey him because he, you have to. You obey him because you get to. The refocus is not obeying out of obligation, but following out of celebration. I follow God because, because he's amazing. He's wonderful. He loves me. And he wants the best things for my life. If I live the way that he tells me to live... It's going to be a better life. I don't, I don't follow out of obligation. I follow out of celebration. Because Jesus loves me and I love him and I just want to do what he tells me to do. Not because I have to, but because I get to. Man, John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, keep my commands. I tell you what, I love me some Jesus. And I want to be able to follow him. Man, I know that if I follow the way that he has for me to live, if I read scripture and I'm like, hey, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. This is, I'm going to follow your plan for my life. Then all of a sudden I have a better life. Oh, I'm going to talk the way that you want me to talk. Not because you're trying to, not because you're trying to make sure, like, hey, hey, don't say those kind of words around here. No, 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 no. No, because all of a sudden now I'm part of life-giving conversations. <laughs> I'm part of life-giving conversations instead of, instead of life-sucking conversations. You know what I'm talking about, right? Y'all been in conversations like that where you just leave that conversation. And you're like, oh, man, I just feel so wore out. Just by the way somebody's talking. Why am I going to talk the way that God wants me to talk? Because all of a sudden, now conversations are full of life. I feel better when I follow the way that God wants me to talk. When I follow the way that God wants me to be able to forgive other people, all of a sudden the weight is taken off of me. I don't have to live with unforgiveness. I don't have to live with bitterness inside of my soul. All of a sudden I'm forgiving people. You're like, well, that was pretty good. Where's some other people that I can forgive, right? Like, that was fantastic. And it, it breaks the burden off of life. It takes it off. 
All of a sudden, when I'm living a life full of generosity and I'm giving God my first and my best and trusting Him with the rest, all of a sudden, I don't look at all the things of this world. I don't look at all this stuff and think, well, this is what I'm trying to pile up. No, instead, my focus is on Jesus, and I know that I'm preparing for eternity. My treasures don't lie here on earth. My treasures lie in heaven. When, it, when, when I live a life of generosity, when I come to church and I serve him, all of a sudden, it's not a, my life's not about me. I'm not here because I have to. I'm here because this is, this is my favorite place to be. My favorite day with my favorite people. I'm not here because I have to. I'm here because I get to be here. I don't follow him out of obligation. I follow him because I know that he has a plan for me. A plan to be able to have a life that is exceedingly and abundantly more. And he's not trying to, he's not trying to give me these like, don't do this. You better do this. No, he's like, hey, hey, hey. That's not, that's not going to lead you down a good path. It's so interesting to me that that first soil is the path. It's hard ground. It's a road. It's a road. I don't know about you, but, but roads go someplace. Where's your focus? What road are you on? Is it your own road or is it a road that leads to God? Matthew 7, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Broad is the road. The way everybody else is living. The way that our culture is living. The way that our culture talks. The way that our culture has values. I'm not trying to have the same values that our world does, that our culture does. I'm not trying to talk the way that our culture does. I'm not trying to live the way that our culture does. Instead, I want to be able to follow God. I want to follow His path. I want to follow that kind of road. Is it an easy road? No, it's not. Is it a road that everybody takes? No, it is not. It's a narrow road. But I'm telling you, that narrow road leads to life. It leads to a parasol's life leads to a life that is exceedingly and abundantly more. Why are you sitting in a place where you're not experiencing this? Because my question is, what road are you on? Are you on the road that is leading you towards God? Or are you saying, you know what? I'm cool. I'm cool with like knowing God, but that following God thing, like that doesn't make any sense to me. Me and the big man upstairs got an understanding. No, you don't. Here's the understanding. He's given you his word, which is the Bible. He says, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. But I love you so much that I know you're not okay. And it's okay to not be okay. But I'm going to make you better. I'm not going to leave you not okay. If you know me, and you follow me. If you understand that I have a good life for you, follow this path. Stop getting distracted by the things of this world. Stop getting distracted by thinking that you have to earn it. Stop getting distracted by all of those things that you got to do more. You don't have to do anything. I've already done it all. Don't get distracted by the things of this world. Don't think that, don't think that this is where everything is. Man, I've got eternity in store for you. I have an exceedingly and abundant kind of life in store for you. That's what God has in store for you. That's the plan. If you simply say yes to Jesus. Church, would you please stand with me today? It's so practical. You just say yes. I'm telling you, it's that practical that you allow the good news of Jesus to penetrate your heart and you just say yes to him, that's the start of it. And then don't get distracted by the things of this world. Instead, you say yes and keep your focus on Jesus.
I'm going to ask you to go ahead and close your eyes today. There's nothing powerful about closing your eyes. It's just that it allows it to be a, a moment between you and God. Nobody's looking around. And if you're in here today, and the distraction that you've had is that you've, you're just like, I don't understand everything in the Word, and I just don't get it. And it's kept you from knowing and following God. But today's a turning point for you. It's a new year. It's a new you. And it starts. It starts with knowing and following God. And so my question to you today is, where is your focus? Put your focus on Jesus and say yes to him. And I want to encourage you, today we're going to respond to that. We're going to respond by saying yes, by just slipping your hand up. And so if today is the day for you to be able to say yes to God, not yes to a good life, not yes to just having your home be a easy and you're here just because of your spouse, but today's the day for you to be able to say yes to Jesus, I just want to ask you to raise your hand up and raise it up now. Raise your hand up now. God, today I say yes to you. Today I say yes to relationship with you. It's easy for me to get distracted. It's easy for me to fall into the things of, of this culture and of this life. But today I say yes to you. And I pray that you'll come into my life. I receive your goodness. I receive your relationship. Come into my life and change me. Lead me into your path, God. I'm going to stop choosing my own path. And I want to choose you. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we praise him together? Always something trying to steal my mood. My crazy thoughts trying to kill my